News for Midday starts now. Stand in former Governor Bob McDonald's corruption trial. Find out the bombshell information the prosecution uncovered. And the CDC issues a warning as the Ebola virus spreads. We'll show you how these restrictions are preventing one local man from seeing his family. And a new metro line is open for the first time in decades. We caught up with riders as they took their first trip on the Silver Line. News for Midday starts now. Welcome to News 4 Midday. I'm Lauren Meyer. And I'm Ariana Poindexter. The Silver Line is the newest addition to local public transportation, and it took its first ride down the metro tracks today. NBC 4's Mikkel Jones hopped on board with riders to see their reaction to a new commuter route. Mikkel? That's right. Reactions filled with excitement at Metro's new Silver Line. Hundreds of people turned out to the grand opening in Reston Station. And now Metro has a new line for people to commute on. See for yourself. We are making history right now on the Silver Line. Yes! And is it My good? nails are silver. High profile officials made a grand entrance from the first car before the opening ceremony could begin. And driving that train, 13 year veteran. Dietrich Washington. At first, I, I, it didn't dawn on me. I said, this is real serious. Okay, yes, I will do it, but <laughs> that's when the nerves set in. But Once that ribbon was cut, Silver Line's first set of riders were on the move at Wheelie Reston Station to be on that first train headed into the district. But for the Reliers who live nearby, just a short commute was on their agenda for the day. I think we're just going to go to Tyson's, grab lunch, hang out, and um, just come back home. It's nice to be able to, you know, head into uh, Tyson's and also just uh, D.C. and do stuff with the kids without the hassle of parking. Tyson's was a popular destination for many passengers coming from both directions, and all was running smoothly until this train that was coming in too fast overshot the platform by four cars. But a simple reverse was able to fix that problem. So phase one officially complete and Metro can look on to phase two to extend its newest line out to Dulles and beyond. Phase two is expected to cost an additional $2.7 billion. Metro expects to have that project completed out to Loudoun County by 2018. Breaking news out of Culpeper County right now, our Jasmine Turner is at the live desk with more. Thanks, Ariana. Developing news out of Culpeper, Virginia, where a family of five was found dead last night. Olivia, Anya, and Omisha Washington, ages 4, 6, and 13, and their parents, Clarence and Shauna, were found shot to death in their home. Their deaths are believed to be a murder-suicide. Family and friends say there was a domestic dispute between the couple on Saturday, but police were not called. Shauna Washington's mother, Diane Minor, and another relative went to check on the family Sunday night where they discovered the bodies. Police are still investigating. At the live desk, I'm Jasmine Turner. Back to you. FBI is making their move official. Today, FBI headquarters say the agency will be leaving the nation's capital. The options for its headquarters have been narrowed to three sites. The first is a warehouse site in Springfield, Virginia. The other two options are in Prince George's County, Maryland. The reason for the big move? FBI operations are rapidly growing. They are now leasing 20 properties around the city to house all of their employees. Officials want the new site to be large enough to keep all operations in one central location. The criteria these sites must meet include having 50 acres of land to expand on, be located two miles from the nearest metro station, and a little more than two miles from the Beltway. FBI officials are not saying when a final decision will be made. GM is in the hot seat again for the ignition switch scandal, and this time the car company is, uh, is coming under fire in a federal courtroom. News 4's Kate Walker tells us how victims and their families are fighting for compensation. One of the most heartbreaking stories to emerge in the aftermath of the General Motors ignition switch scandal is that of Trenton Buzzard and his family. He was just shy of one year old when the ignition on his grandmother's car failed, killing both his grandmother and his aunt five years ago. Trent was on Capitol Hill today alongside other victims' families to deliver emotional testimonies to top executives at GM, including CEO Mary Barra. Like any curious six-year-old, Trenton Buzzard squirms around in his seat, eyeing the cameras and the crowd around him. But there is one major difference. Trent peers out at the world from a small red wheelchair. My son uh, is left paralyzed from, his, from about his belly button down. 
He's had a trait. He still has a feeding tube, um, countless other injuries. His family has taken to Capitol Hill today, along with other victims' families, to confront General Motors with their personal stories, holding tightly to photographs of their lost loved ones. An ignition switch defect has forced GM to recall more than 17 million vehicles. That's 15 times what the company has sold this year. Many are now questioning GM's commitment to safety and wondering why it has taken over a decade to address such a fatal problem. The answer is simple. I will not rest on the, until these problems are resolved. As I told our employees, I'm not afraid of the truth, and I'm not going to accept business as usual at GM. In a room down the hall from the victims' families, CEO Mary Barra testified before Congress, continuing to apologize and outlining a plan to assist both the company and the victims in moving forward. It's time, in fact, it's past time, to insist on total accountability and to make sure vital information is shared across all functions of the company. Barr's apologies and promises have yet to ease the pain for the victims and their families. He's got to live the rest of his life this way. And um, GM needs to accept responsibility um, for what they have done and make things right for all these families behind me, including my son that has to live the rest of his life the way he is. Lawmakers will continue to grill top executives at GM in a series of hearings scheduled for the next few weeks. Families will begin filing claims August 1st. I'm Kate Walker, News 4. All eyes were on Johnny Williams as he testified in former Virginia Governor Bob McDonald's corruption trial. Today, new court documents paint Williams as a virtual ATM for the McDonald family. Daughters using Williams' jet for a bachelorette party, golf outings, lavish vacations, and trips on a yacht. All detailed by prosecutors. Given immunity to testify against his former first friends and dressed as the businessman he is, Williams was relaxed on the witness stand as he explained to the prosecutor why he originally wanted to meet the governor. He's a politician and I'm a businessman, Williams said. Prosecutors say he gave the McDonald's and his children more than $150,000 in gifts, trips and loans in exchange for help in promoting his pet project, a dietary supplement. Earlier today, Williams's longtime assistant, Jerry Fulkerson, testified she was often the one making arrangements for McDonald trips and the one signing the checks. Forging Johnny Williams's name, she walked prosecution through emails and documents showing all the things Williams gave the McDonald family. Golf outings, vacations, yacht rentals, use of Williams's private plane, loans, and a $10,000 wedding gift to a McDonald daughter. The uh, extent of the gifts that were given to the McDonald's by uh, Johnny Williams uh, was far beyond uh, what we normally would get from a personal friend. Williams' testimony is far from over. The prosecution will continue to question him tomorrow, and things may get more intense as the defensive tries to challenge his credibility. We'll keep you updated as more information comes in. A nine-year-old girl and her father have died after a summer vacation took a tragic turn. A small plane hit the family while making an emergency landing on a beach in Venice, Florida. The pilot made a public appearance after killing Army Sergeant Omi Irizari and his daughter Oceana. She died this morning after being airlifted to a hospital with critical injuries. Pilot Carl Kokomor said he landed on a beach where the Irizari family was to avoid a crowded beach nearby. The pilot statement also explains that his engine failed during a sightseeing flight and that he was losing altitude and could barely steer the plane. Kokomor says he never saw the Irizari family. The second American Ebola patient has made it back to the U.S. Jasmine Turner has more at the live desk. Jasmine? Developing now at the live desk, the second American infected with Ebola has landed safely in Atlanta, Georgia. 59-year-old Nancy Wrightbull, a missionary in Liberia, arrived at Dobbins Air Reserve Base this morning. She was transported in the same jet as 33-year-old physician Kent Brantley, the first U.S. Ebola patient. Both Wrightbull and Brantley were infected in Liberia. And and Wright Bull was working at a faith-based clinic in Liberia. They have both received an experimental drug cocktail and their conditions are slowly improving. The number of Ebola outbreaks in West Africa is increasing at an alarming rate, with the World Health Organization reporting 163 new cases and 61 deaths at the end of last week. The international community is also coming together in order to stop the spread of this deadly disease. And for now, there isn't a threat of Ebola reaching the 
United States. At the Live Desk, I'm Jasmine Turner. Back to you guys. Thanks, Jasmine. Kids are heading back to school soon, but in Langley Park, some parents will be joining their kids in the classroom. A new program gives parents who immigrated to the U.S. a chance to gain a first-class education. A recent report outlined Langley's growing dropout rate and students' unstable home lives. By educating parents, experts believe they can reduce these incidents. Education advocates say for many of these families, this is their first chance to gain an education. They have had very limited ex educational experiences in their homeland, um, and that is, and that means that they have very limited experiences in the, with the educational system here in the United States. The program will start by offering English classes to parents. Casa says the plan for funding the project is still underway. Keep your kids safe and accounted for in the heat and inside the car. A 17-year-old inventor may have the trick. 18 children have died this year in hot cars nationwide. The hot seat designed by Alyssa Chavez could be a lifesaver. This device is a pad that is placed in, under the inside of any car seat. The pad is connected through a fob for your keychain and an app on your phone. If a child is left in the car and your keychain is over 40 feet away, the pad will sound off as an alert system. Loud enough to grab people's attention around the vehicle as well as remind the parent on their key fob or their cell phone. This science fair entry turned patented idea is ready to enter the prototype stage to show retailers, says inventor Chavez. Alyssa is on her way with an Indiegogo fundraiser campaign set up for the hot seat. We look forward to seeing the next stages of her safety device. Up next on News 4, the deadly Ebola virus is on the move. We'll tell you how some local travelers can't get home to be with loved ones. New rules are passed for D.C. gun laws. We'll tell you what changes have been made and why local lawmakers are fighting the ruling. And a cancer survivor in Virginia is welcomed home by her family. We'll show you what they did to make one of her dreams come true. Stay with us. A victory in the LGBT community this week in Virginia, federal courts ruled the state's ban on same-sex marriage unconstitutional. In a two-to-one decision, the fourth, court, the fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond wrote, denying same-sex marriage couples in same-sex couples this choice prohibits them from participating fully in our society. While this does not mean gay marriage and lesbian couples can get married quite yet, many Virginians are excited with this step toward marriage equality as the Attorney General of Virginia has historically refused to back the ban. I am proud that the Commonwealth of Virginia is leading on one of the most important civil rights issues of our day. This is just a day to celebrate. I mean, we have just, when I think about this, we joined this case back in September, and here we are not even a year later, and look at this. Now, 19 states in the U.S. allow same-sex marriage, and Virginia could be the next. This case is one of many that may reach the U.S. Supreme Court very soon. A new ruling today on D.C. gun laws. Now anyone legally who legally owns a handgun in D.C. can carry it out in the open or concealed. The district's Office of Attorney General is asking the judge to put the ruling on hold as they consider an appeal. The case came before the counts after the people sued the district for restricting their right to carry in the city. But many are voicing safety concerns. People cannot forget that this is the nation's capital. Uh, that we have the president who lives here. I don't think there's any more sensitive place in the nation than uh, the District of Columbia. For now, D.C. police are abiding by the new ruling and are not restricting residents from legally carrying handguns, but police are allowed to stop anyone who is carrying and ask for proof of a legal permit. It happened again. Another gun in the Capitol building. NBC4's Lauren Meyer has the latest incident and tells us how some D.C. delegates are reacting. That's right, Ariana. It happened twice in the last week. Two people are now facing charges after attempting to carry a gun inside the U.S. Capitol complex. And this morning, a strong warning to visitors of the Capitol. First, it was a congressional staff member, and this time a lobbyist. At around 9 a.m. this morning, Ronald Prestige, a turkey farmer from South Carolina, came through this security checkpoint where he was stopped. When U.S. Capitol Police searched his briefcase, they found a loaded 9mm Ruger like the one pictured here. 
Prestige was immediately taken into custody and charged with carrying a gun without a license. He was on his way to the office of South Carolina Congressman Tom Rice. However, his staff was unaware of the arrest and did not have any idea as to why he would be meeting with the congressman. News 4 spoke to District of Columbia Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton about how she thinks these events will impact the public. I don't think it will have an effect upon our tourists. I do think it may have an effect upon people who might otherwise have tried to bring guns into the District of Columbia, because now they are told, not a good idea. In just less than a week, there have been two incidents of people bringing illegal handguns onto the U.S. Capitol complex. Both incidents took place in the Cannon Office Building, where the teams of at least 85 congressional districts are housed. Last week's incident involved a staffer to a Pennsylvania congressman. He has been suspended from his job and is still awaiting a court date. He says he brought the gun to work by mistake. As gun-related incidents are increasing in the District of Columbia, Holmes Norton hopes that this occurrence will send a message. Uh, I don't think that that necessarily means we ought to put anybody in jail who made a mistake, but I think this is a uh, learning opportunity to teach the rest of the country how to behave when you come to the District of Columbia. Although he was arrested earlier today, Prestige will be spending the night in jail until he appears before a judge tomorrow. He could face up to five years behind bars and find up to $5,000. The Centers for Disease Control have recently issued a huge warning for travelers concerning the Ebola virus. That's right. The CDC is telling travelers not to go to countries hit hardest by this outbreak. I caught up with a man at Dulles International who cannot even see his own family because of this advisory. His name is Abdul Rahman Bangora, and he just applied for a job at Dulles International. He came here from Sierra Leone six months ago to start finding work so he could send money back home to his family. He's now trying to go back home, but is being told to stay away because of the spreading disease there. My kids, my whole family is there. Yeah. It's really difficult for us right now. The way we hear the situation in our country, it's not really good. The CDC says it's unlikely for the disease to have an outbreak here in the U.S., and it's rare that you could even catch it just from sitting next to someone on a plane. But even if Dulles were forced to deal with an infected patient, they have quarantine stations around the airport ready to isolate them. CDC Director Tom Frieden released a statement saying, We do not anticipate this will spread in the U.S. if an infected person is hospitalized here. But we are taking action now by alerting health care workers in the U.S. and reminding them how to isolate and test suspected patients while following strict infection control procedures. President Obama says it's not another Cold War, but he has recently announced tougher economic sanctions on Russia and President Putin. This comes in light of the continuing crisis in Ukraine and the downing of the Malaysian Airlines flight back Russian, backed by Russian separatists. We're blocking the exports of specific goods and technologies to the Russian energy sector. We're expanding our sanctions to more Russian banks and defense companies. And we're formally suspending credit that encourages exports to Russia and financing for economic development projects in Russia. The president goes on to say that the European Union is joining the U.S. in imposing major sanctions on Russia. President Obama also said that the U.S. will continue to lead the international community in, the, in our support for Ukrainian people. Still no border security solution after a day of deliberating in Congress. And now Capitol Hill's August recess is in full swing. Yes, unfortunately, Congress was not able to make a decision on the new push for a short-term short -term border fix. The fix had House Republicans proposing a $659 million funding bill to strengthen the border and stop individual hearings for each child. Hispanic Democrats said no way. They argued that judges would grant asylum to several kids. Even if this bill had passed the House, the plan would not have made it out of the Senate due to the recess. This means lawmakers lost an opportunity to stop the surface of kids crossing the border and aid those already there. A new plan cannot be put into action until September.
Now to the border crisis here in the area. Clergy leaders in Maryland met with Governor Martin O'Malley today to talk about potential shelter plans for kids who have already arrived in the state. Between January and early July, more than 2,200 unaccompanied kids have arrived in Maryland. Many are staying with extended family or in foster care. The O'Malley administration is suggesting Montgomery County, among several other sites, for possible temporary housing facilities. Meanwhile, school officials in Montgomery County tell News 4 they had more than 100 unaccompanied minors in the system last school year. Well, Ariana, my family's been buying a lot of produce this summer, but that stuff gets expensive when it comes for barbecues. Yeah, Mikkel, and many people end up, end up clipping endless amounts of coupons to save. NBC4's Jasmine Turner is sharing simple ways to knock down your grocery bill. You're ready to grocery shop and you may or may not have that list in hand, but you know one thing for sure, you want to save some money. Well, you can skip the couponing with this one because here are five ways to save on your next trip. First, stock up on items you regularly buy. When your favorite foods go on sale, use it as an opportunity to save by buying several of the same thing, especially if the items have a long shelf life, then you don't have to worry about, worry about purchasing it again for a while. Next, buy in bulk. And no, you don't have to buy toilet paper and paper towels in bulk. Go to your local warehouse club and buy things like meat fish or poultry in bulk as well. Utilize your freezer space instead of buying meat in smaller quantities at a grocery store. And next, don't buy your personal care items in the grocery store. Go to the dollar store or a more discounted place to buy those items or check a sale at a local drugstore. And then, Skip the pre-prepared and convenience foods. For example, save your money and buy a fresh head of lettuce for $1.99 versus a pre-packaged bag for $3.79. Take the few extra moments to wash and cut it instead of paying more. And of course, in order to save big, you have to prepare. You plan before you buy a new television or computer, so why not do the same when it comes to your groceries? You'll definitely save big. When you see someone in need, do you stop? Do you help? One Gaithersburg man saw people hurting, hungry, and now his food pantry is feeding thousands of people every month. Arnold Harvey and his wife are real life angels to thousands around the area. Harvey got the idea while working as a waste management driver. He remembers seeing children eating out of garbage cans and people sleeping in the streets. Those images encouraged him to start a food bank out of his home, he and his wife sold their stock in 401k and created what is now God's Connection Transition. Today, the organization serves over 3,000 people per month and still growing. Now the Harveys want to expand their food pantry. They plan to include a housing development that provides vocational training. For more information, including how to volunteer, go to NBCWashington.com and search GCT. After beating cancer, a Virginia girl gets a hero's welcome home. News 4's Jasmine Turner joined the young survivor's family in surprising her with the trip of a lifetime. Take a look. I said one day I want to go to swim with dolphins. That's been my dream ever since. To swim with dolphins and be cancer free. That's nine-year-old Tara Sanker's wish and today she got it. Amazed. I was speechless. How she felt when she walked into her luau themed party hosted by United Health and the Make a Wish Foundation. <laughs> Greeted by Aloha, music, LA, and all of her favorite treats, Tara got one step closer to her trip of a lifetime. With all the things that any kid with cancer goes through, it's really nice to know that there are still people out there. She's been going through treatment for leukemia, and her mom Tammy is hopeful that today marks the start of a cancer-free life. We're very excited. It's over. We're keeping our fingers crossed that it's over. And then to come here, this was like a thousand times more than what I expected it to be. I know we were having a party, but I don't know what it was like. It's been a long road for the Sanker family, and now the treatment for Tara is done. They're excited for her to swim with dolphins not just once, but twice. We've already worked on an excursion for her to go swim with the wild dolphins, too. So we're really going to make that dream come true for her. And more than the trips and fun parties, there's one thing that continues to give them hope. To see the smile on her face is everything is worth it. Jasmine Turner, News 4.
What a lovely story. And that's News 4 Midday. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to tune in to News 4 at 4, 5, and 6 for all of this day's news. We'll be back tomorrow morning at 11. We we'll hope you join us then. See you then.